All right. All right, so what I said was, good evening. All right. And welcome back. I'm all right. And as John said, we are discussing heaven tonight. And um, we are going to be in about 30 different places as we begin. So let's open with a word of prayer and we'll go. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you, Lord, and we're so thankful for this topic, Lord. We're so thankful that you've uh, provided a way for us, Lord, that you uh, showed us through the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, that there is uh, life after death. And Lord, what more could we ask for than vis visual proof, Lord, and, and that this place is better than we can imagine, Lord, that all of our... Uh, all of the joy that we desire and the peace that we desire, Lord, you've provided for us. And so we pray for a faithful journey, Lord, here on earth and, and to rejoice tonight in what we're going to hear from you about heaven, Lord. So um, we ask that your spirit be with us, that it, you keep us uh, straight in line and accurate and telling all the truths that you want to be known, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, heaven. <clears throat> now, a little awkward to talk about a topic that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we read this about it. I have so many bookmarks, I don't even know which one to pull on here. 1 Corinthians 2 says this, the Apostle Paul starting verse 6. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature... Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So first of all, <clears throat> if I had you close your eyes <clears throat> and give your very best thoughts of heaven for about 30 seconds, and you just kept building upon that thought in greatness, and kept building upon it in greatness, like these waves of grace, greatness, just overcoming your thoughts and your thoughts and your thoughts, and then I snapped you out of it 30 seconds later, and had you share your greatest thoughts of heaven, I could promise you my answer to whatever you shared would be, it's better than that. It's better than that. Okay? Paul says you can't fathom what God's prepared. Remember, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. Now, although it says that nobody's seen or heard it doesn't mean we can't know some things. In fact, the very next verse says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. So these things have been revealed through his spirit, and we're going to see what Paul, who actually visited heaven, has to say. So we're going to go to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. And we get this testimony from him there, starting in verse 1. Paul said, it's doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now we believe Paul's talking about himself here. In fact, we believe he's probably talking about the time he was stoned and left for dead. He was on the verge of death. There was an opportunity where God caught him up to the third heaven. And scholars will say that Paul would have referred to like this atmosphere that we breathe every day as the first heaven. Outer space is the second heaven. And where God and the angels dwell is the third heaven. So he was caught up to that third heaven. He says, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words 
which is not lawful for a man to utter. So imagine that dynamic. Like, what would you say if Paul said to you, listen, I was caught up to heaven and I heard inexpressible words. It's not even lawful for me to utter to you. You know, what, what kind of place is that? What kind of place is beyond speech? Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. So here's what he's getting at. What I saw was so great, there's some things that Paul said it's not even lawful for me to utter. And then he says, because of the revelations that I've received, he'll say this in the next verse, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. So the abundance of the revelations that he's received about heaven risks him becoming this proud, arrogant, boastful person. Okay? It's like he can't even control who he's going to become because of what he's seen. So a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Can you imagine just to buffet you, you need a messenger of Satan, Satan to torment you. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, Paul got the 39 lashes that Jesus received. He got those on five different occasions. Paul was stoned and left for dead. Paul was beaten over the head with rods three different times. Of all those things, he never reports of him crying out for mercy there. But whatever this thorn in the flesh is, three times he cries out to the Lord to take it from him. It had to be severe. And the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Did you guys hear that, by the way? Okay, do you know that you always have sufficient grace for you, always? No matter what you're going through, you always have grace that's sufficient. The Bible says God will give you grace in your time of need. Like students like to ask me, hey, if somebody held a gun to your head and said, do you believe in God, would you say yes? And I say, you know what, it's hard to ask when you ask me right now, but I bet you anything, if it really happened, God would give me sufficient grace to honor him in that moment. Because he gives grace in your time of need. Okay? Therefore, most gladly, I'll rather boast in my infirmities, the power that may rest upon me. So he's saying, listen, I had to get this tormenting thing to keep me from being some arrogant, boastful sinner about the revelations that I've seen because they're literally too good for me to contain in a way that I'm not going to be arrogant about. That's where we're going to be forever. He's saying, listen, there's some things that are not lawful for me to utter. I can tell you this. Everything a human eye has seen and everything a human ear has heard and everything that's ever entered into a human mind has not comprehended the greatness of heaven yet. It's all better than that. Okay? It's all better than that. Now, I personally believe his thorn in the flesh was an eye issue that he had because A, we know he was blinded. B, <clears throat> He'll say things like this to the Galatians. He'll say, your love for me was so great that if you could have, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Now, that's not the kind of love that makes Hallmark cards, is it? Okay? So it's either just a very weird thing to say to somebody or he was known to really have an eye issue. And then he'll write elsewhere because, you know, he would use an amanuensis. He would use a scribe to dictate for him. You actually... You actually hear from that scribe in Romans 16 as Paul's giving greetings to people. He, he's greeting people, greeting people, greeting people. And then he'll say, and I, Tertius, greet you as well, who, the one who writes this with his own hand. So Tertius was his amanuensis. And you would certainly use an amanuensis if you had eye issues. And then when he's making a fervent point, he'll say, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. And what's his proof that he's writing with his own hand? He'll say, see what large letters I'm using. Now, why would that be a signature of his handwriting? People write large when they suffer with eye problems, correct? So with that evidence, it's like it could be that his thorn in the flesh was, were his eye issues. Now, so heaven is greater than we can imagine. Now, we're going to get some details on heaven. We're going to take what we've been allowed to know about heaven, 
tonight. And we're going to start with the most common question people ask about heaven, is heaven a real place? And the answer is yes. Well, how do I know? Because there's a guy who rose from the dead who said there was a real place called heaven. And he gets a lot of credibility for rising from the dead, doesn't he? Okay. So uh, based on the testimony of Christ himself and now Paul, um, heaven is a real place. Now what, what is heaven? Well, we know it's a dwelling place of God. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 41, the writer writes, Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God who is in heaven. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So where are they bearing witness? The, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in heaven. We also know that heaven is the dwelling place of the righteous. In Matthew chapter 25, it says, When the Son of Man comes, Jesus talking, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will, seek, he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or come and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. So what I want you to notice it says in verse 37, then the righteous will answer him. The righteous will answer him. Um, so it's the righteous that he's prepared this place where he says, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then you get some detail of what a righteous person does. What are the outworkings of a, of a righteous person? And it's caring for the least of these, isn't it? It's caring for the least of these. Jesus is mystically present with the least of these. So he says, when you've done these things to them, you've done it to me as well. All right. So John chapter 14 speaks of the righteous presence in heaven. We get the first four verses. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. And of course, he'll answer the next question by saying that he is the way. He is the way. So we see <clears throat> heaven as a dwelling place of God, heaven as a dwelling place of the righteous. And in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus will share this with us. In verse 30, he will say, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So who else is in heaven? The angels, okay? So we see the Trinity in heaven, we see the righteous in heaven, and we see the angels in heaven. Now, I'm trying to anticipate our question and answer time, so I'm going to try to answer some of those right off the bat. So first question, will, the, will there be our physical bodies in heaven? 
or is it a spirit place? All right, well, we have a perfect chapter in Scripture that answers that question. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to go through virtually all of this because it's about your physical presence in heaven. That's a good thing to hear about, isn't it? Your physical, bodily presence in heaven. Paul starts this most important chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you first of all, but first means in importance. It's the most important thing he delivered to them, he says. That which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. Everlasting life has eyewitness testimony, doesn't it? The dead man rose again and was seen. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So Paul challenges the readers of his day to go investigate with the hundreds of people that saw the risen Christ. Go ask them yourselves. It's not just the lone testimony of Paul or the apostles. There were hundreds. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In this life only, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So you can hear what he's saying about the importance of the resurrection. He's literally saying, if Christ is not risen, pack up your bags and go home, you pitiable people who have no hope in this world. Okay? It all hinges on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And he says, if Christ is risen, then there is resurrection. If Christ is risen, then there is resurrection. I'm going to turn to Mark 12. I want you to hear what Jesus says about this. In Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 18, this is the Sadducees who don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe in life after death. That makes them very sad, you see. (laughs) Pretty good, right? Okay. All right. Now. (laughs) All right. Then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him saying, teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man bro- man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. That's the kinsman redeemer law in Israel. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying he left no offspring. The second took her and he died, nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Now, they're trying to say this whole idea of resurrection gets silly. They're trying to make it an argument, an argument ad absurdum, that it's, it gets to a level of absurdity when you play it out. So here's a woman, and there's her seven husbands, and now whose husband is she going to be? 
Now, Jesus' answer is going to fit for every atheistic question that you'll ever hear. Okay, his answer says this. Are you not mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. There's the two reasons people are mistaken. They don't know the scriptures and they don't know the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not a God of the dead, but a God, the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. What did Jesus just do there? He says, you don't believe in, in resurrection? Then answer me this. Why did God introduce himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Three guys by our definition that are dead. He says, but God knows better. They're not dead. That's why he calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. He just said Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Okay? So they don't know the scriptures. And so he corrects them on their knowledge of the scriptures. And they also don't know the power of God. And what's the power of God in this passage? Resurrection. Life after death. He's going to raise the dead. All right. All right, so back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, capital M, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming, then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted, meaning the Father is not under Christ. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, our bodies, what happens to us as believers when we die? So Paul anticipates that question. He's going to answer it starting in verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. So God gave us farming, which is an you know, uh, occupation from the beginning of, of mankind. He gave us farming so that we would have this picture of resurrection in our minds because he knows that's a hard thing for people to believe, even today, correct? Resurrection from the dead is a hard thing for people to believe. So God gave us farming. So you think about what you put into the soil comes out far different and how it comes out is far more glorious than what you put in. You could literally flip an acorn in your hand, but when that becomes an oak tree, you're gonna have a little more trouble doing that, aren't you? Okay, so what God does with an acorn makes it immensely more glorious than it started. What is he going to do with you and me? Okay, so Paul is going to say that unless that seed goes into the ground and dies, it'll never receive the body that it was intended to have. And that's a picture that God wants you to know about you. Until you go into the ground and die, you'll never have the body that you're intended to have. Okay, you're going to be far more glorious than that. So he'll go on to say in verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. 
There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection from the dead. So we're going to vary in glory in heaven. We're going to vary in glory. The body is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. Now, how many of you have been by bedsides where the body doesn't look so good? Okay, especially things about cancer and things like that can really do a number on our bodies, correct? And when you think about that, I want you to hear this. The body is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. We have to cover ourselves, correct? It's raised in glory. So what do you think Adam and Eve lost when they bit of the fruit? They lost glory. What did they acquire? Shame, right? They acquired shame and they lost their glory. Here it says, what did they realize when they lost their glory? That they were naked, right? They, they, um, they realized they were naked and they had to cover themselves. They, they, their body was dishonored and had to be covered. But it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it's written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. So this is what we got to go through first, correct? But we can't let what comes first distract us from what comes next. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are also those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And then Paul celebrates these thoughts. Verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. This is when the bodily resurrection occurs. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now I want you to think, if you've never heard or read this before, would you have ever come up with the word victory to finish a sentence about death? Okay? It's a word the Bible gives us. It's gonna, your death is going to end in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. When we sin, we're flirting with death. We're creating wages for ourselves that have to be paid. Every time we sin, we're creating wages that have to be paid, and the wages of that sin is death. Every time we sin, we're, we're acquiring that. And yet Jesus died that death. The strength of sin is the law. Okay? Now Paul will say the law is holy, but the law can't make you righteous. In fact, the purpose of the law is to show you the impossibility of your righteousness. If it wasn't for the law, you might actually think you can be righteous. Then when you read the law, you realize you're helpless. The purpose of the law is to point you to Christ. It's a point, because what's the, what's the standard of the law? What's it to achieve in you? Perfection, okay? The priesthood was supposed to bring you to a state of perfection. That's why Hebrews tells us that's why that priesthood had to go away. It couldn't make anybody perfect. We needed a better priesthood, okay? Um, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, now with all of this idea of resurrection, all this idea of life after death, all this idea that all we know now is corruption and natural body and weakness, and that's all we know now. But we have these promises that have been verified through visual testimony of Christ risen from the dead. 
now it says, when you understand this, you should be steadfast, you should be immovable, you should always be abounding in the work of the Lord, because now you know your labor is not in vain. Now you know whatever you spend yourself on for the Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be a resurrection and your glory will vary from other people's glory, correct? Okay? There's varying glories. So the martyrs are going to be very glorious, right? Very, very glorious. And those who spend themselves for the gospel and not for the things of the world, literally choosing your profession based on how you serve God, not how you serve manna, because you can't serve two masters, correct? Now you can earn the manna and then use that for the gospel, or you can work in ministry, and I promise you, you're not pursuing manna there, okay? Okay. <laughs> That's what I said. You can't serve the gospel, okay, and get rich, okay? Now, all right. So what I want to do in the second half of the class today is to bring you to Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. Now, if you notice, there's more pages of notes tonight than I've ever given you. Because <clears throat> um, during the COVID uh, time, when we were brought into our living rooms to do these teachings, uh, we were doing the book of Revelation, and <clears throat> I spent so many hours preparing that study that there's no way I'm not going to use it every time I can. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here we are in Revelation, and this is some of the most glorious pictures of heaven. We get straight from the inspired author, John. Now, right after, because remember, John didn't write in chapters. He didn't create these chapter divisions. So right after, he talks about the lake of fire, death in Hades, um, the unrighteous dead being cast into that lake of fire, where the devil and his demons are going. Okay? I don't care what place you call it. If there's a place prepared for the devil and his demons, it's not a place you want to go. In fact, to be worth your entire life to make sure you don't go there, correct? All right, that's literally how my journey started, okay? I learned about hell at a very, very young age, and um, <laughs> God was preparing me for ministry because I used to sit in my backyard with a hose, and I'd stick it in the ground, and I'd imagine that I was trying to put out the fires of hell, and I'm sitting there going, take that, devil, you know? <laughs> And, um, and then I'd be so worried that the devil was after me. I lived about 100 yards from a lake, and I was not allowed to travel in the street, but I would. I'd walk right in the middle of the street to the lake, because when I walked on the sidewalk, I always felt like those parked cars in the driveways, Satan would just back them over me. So I got into the middle of the street where I felt safer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, I put that on my resume when I apply for ministry jobs. I'm like, I've been fighting Satan since I was five, man. And, um, and I'll, I'll never forget, and I like sharing this because it motivates others, but um, I heard this once and it stuck with me and it really kind of molds my getting out of bed in the morning and, and going to work is uh, a saying that says, I want to be the type of man that when my feet hit the floor in the morning, Satan says, oh crap, he's up, okay? So um, I love that actually. Now, knowing Satan, he says it more vulgarly than that, but that was the polite version. All right, so Revelation 21. After that picture of the great white throne judgment and all its awfulness, John says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Now, what kind of detail is that? There's no more sea. Well, John is bringing you all the way back to Genesis 1 because when the earth was uninhabitable, it was described as darkness and deep. And until God creates light and land, there will be no life. So God's got to overcome the darkness and the deep to bring life upon the earth. And now this is a celebration in Revelation 21. It says there's no more sea. God has overcome the deep. 
So the deep is no longer a threat. Okay? It's also a silly part of evolution. I like to mention whenever I can that this thought that we crawled out of the sea as we evolved and the sea is three quarters of the earth. So all we did in our brilliant evolution is limit the space that we can live in to just 25% of the planet instead of the 75% that we were in. And now we can only live on one level where in the water we can live at all sorts of depths and so forth. And now when we go back into it, we die. What kind of evolution is that? It should be where you can walk in and out whenever you want. That's evolution. That's getting better, right? That's how it should be. Not make it where the very place I was born will now kill me. That's not very evolved. Anyways, stay tuned for apologetics later on. <laughs> now, <clears throat> so there's no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This wedding motif if there's one motif that I would have to teach through all 66 of the Bibles, it would be a wedding motif. The Bible's always giving you this marriage motif. Adam and Eve start as a created married couple. It starts at a wedding. The Bible ends at a wedding feast. And the whole idea is this father choosing a bride for his son throughout the entire Bible. Jesus will teach parables about kings throwing weddings for his son. It's how we're to understand all of this. And we're invited to attend the wedding. But amazingly, it says you've got to be dressed properly. Jesus will teach a parable that a wedding guest showed up without wedding garments on. And he gets cast into hell for it. Okay? And that's where I share it with my students. They hate our dress code. Look at God's dress code. Right? He gets thrown into hell. Why? Because he showed up with his own righteousness. The idea is it's you're clothed in righteousness. And you've got to show up with the king's righteousness. Okay? You're, you're saved by the righteousness of God as revealed from faith to faith. Not the righteousness of you or me. Okay? It's the righteousness of God that's revealed from faith to faith to faith to faith to faith. That's what you show up in the wedding. It is believing in Christ. You receive the righteousness of Christ. And that's what you're judged by. And he receives your sin. And that's why he dies. And then he says, I, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. So I want you to see this picture. The tabernacle is where God dwelt in the wilderness, and, and he, do, he comes down, he dwells with his people in the tabernacle. First of all, he dwells with man in Eden. Sin comes, or separation. So now there's this prescribed way of approaching God, that because of his holiness, you have to do it in the prescribed way or you will die. And, and, the, and, and so there's priests that, that kind of mediate that whole approaching God thing. There's veils to keep you out and all of this. And then uh, you read in John 1, 14 that, that, that God was the word who became flesh and did what? Tabernacled or dwelt amongst us. So he comes and does the dwelling with us. And now he dies, he rises, he ascends to heaven, sends the Holy Spirit to be with us always. And then a new heaven and new earth come, new Jerusalem comes down, and now he's tabernacling with us once again. And he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. There's... The perfect in heaven is the perfect relationship between us and God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Isn't it amazing how hard it is to get people to go to heaven? You know, you watch these Bahamas commercials and people are like, I want to go, I want to go. Then you say, hey, no more death, suffering, crying, tears. And they're like, I don't know about that. I don't know about that place, All right? There should be no more pain for the former things that passed away. I love saying this at memorial services. We keep hearing, hey, so-and-so passed away, so-and-so passed away, so-and-so passed away. No, they didn't. They passed on. Their pain passed away. Their death passed away. Their sorrow passed away. And their crying passed away. They did not pass away. They passed onward. The things that bothered them passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. 
Okay, listen. I already connected the Revelation 1 deep to no more C, right? Spanned all 66 books to do that, right? From the Genesis 1 to Revelation 21. Now this says, I make all things new. What's he doing there? He's showing you that he's a greater Solomon. What was Solomon's big cry through Ecclesiastes? There's nothing new under the sun. We need a better king than that, don't we? And Jesus comes and declares that he makes all things new. He said to me, write for these words are true and faithful. Now, the new Jerusalem, where we're going to dwell. Now, you're going to hear me harp on something that whenever I can, I harp on this. Then one of the seven angels had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. That's, that's the church, right? And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a mo most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. Now, if you picture when, when Israel camps in the wilderness, God says, I want three tribes on the north side of the tabernacle, three on the east, three on the south, three on the west. He's given you that picture of heaven in the Exodus wilderness because now you have the gates with the three names, the three names, the three names, and the three names. And even more remarkably to me, when you read Genesis 45, when Joseph is reunited with his brothers in Egypt and they haven't recognized him yet, but when they finally do recognize him, and they start weeping. The Bible says they came all together and Joseph was weeping over them. And now you see that picture of these heavenly gates with the 12 tribes all in this big circle like they are in heaven. But there's no more crying, right? So you see that these brothers are gonna be together. Their names will be on these gates. The weeping will be over. The reunion is complete. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So now you have 12 gates with the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Covenant there, and now you have 12 foundations with the 12 apostles on there. And what did Paul say? There's no other foundation that can be laid except for the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that's the new covenant the apostles brought in, correct? Correct. And now you see that foundation in heaven. And the apostles' names are on there. The new covenant names are on there. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city's laid out in a square. So it's talking about New Jerusalem as a measurable square city. So think about this. Okay? Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. That's 1,342 miles is its length, its breadth, and its height are all equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Then construction of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. You get all of these colors of jewels that are all over the walls of the city. That's where you're going to dwell. Okay? So, John, what am I going to talk about now? Stained glass windows. Okay? I love stained glass windows. Why? Because it's the colors of the city. And it's laid out for you in the windows of the church to remind you of the city you're going to. We need these reminders, don't we? Okay? 
Now, Protestant pastors hate when I teach this because Protestantism finds itself in storefronts all the time, right? We're in storefronts. We have no visual reminders of jeweled cities or anything. We come in, and it looks just like the gym that was here before, right? We need visual reminders. We don't need idols. I'm not talking about idols. I'm talking about beauty that captures the heart of God. When God tells Solomon to build a temple, it ain't a warehouse. <laughs> it's spectacular. It's gold everywhere. Okay? The bricks have gold inside the bricks. Okay? We, 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 we need these visual reminders. That's why I believe churches need steeples. You need to get your gaze going up to heaven. And looking at a cross up in the heavens. Every city's highest point should be the cross of Christ peering over the city on top of a steeple in a church. And I believe with all my heart you'll see the behavior of that city change. Okay? You know, we used to put all sorts of angelic or even demonic beings on our ledges of our skyscrapers all the time. And we changed all that. At least when people looked up, they knew there was a spiritual realm going on. They had a representation of that. Now they just see whatever fancy design an architect can come up with, but it's basically saying there is no spiritual world. You have nothing to look at here but the creation of man in concrete and glass, and you see the behavior of the people in cities like that. Okay. All right, anyways. And I promise you, I went off from this pulpit on a Sunday morning on that, I teased Pastor Steve, talking about we need visual things to look at, and I said, but that's a lovely wall, Steve, that's so helpful, and I promise you within a couple weeks, he said that wall's coming down, because we bought the place next door, and the wall's coming down, so now I'm going to preach on the carpet, because that's not very nice either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll get the solid gold streets in here. All right. Now, yeah, for sure. Okay. Now, uh, let's go to 22 and get a little more picture of heaven here. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Now you wonder, what healing do we need in heaven, correct? Well, actually the word for healing here, and in this Bible I didn't write it down, but the word for healing here is the word of health giving. It's more of bringing you health more than healing ills. So you should have that kind of picture of healthiness is what the healing is, not, not mending our ills um, in heaven. There should be no more curse. Okay, so from Genesis 3, biting of the apple, to this point in time, it's been cursed. Now there's no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Is there anything unholy, unspiritual about service? It's what goes on in heaven, Correct. Work goes on in heaven. They shall see his face. What have you heard throughout all of scripture? Nobody can see his face and live, right? Why? You're unglorified. Okay, there's literally a purity and, and an awesomeness to his purity that will kill you in your unglorified state. Now you'll see him. They shall see his face, the lamb's face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. Now remember in the Old Testament, when we see Christophanes or angels of the Lord and people ask their name, they'll say, why do you ask my name? And they'll say, it's just seeing that it's wonderful. That's what you get for their name. And now it says, his name shall be on your forehead. Okay? Why would he put his name on your forehead? You're his. Right? You're his. There should be no night there. What was the two things that prevented life in Genesis 1? Darkness and deep. There's no night, there's no sea. Okay? There's no night, there's no sea. The darkness is overcome, the deep has been overcome. 
They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What a picture. What a picture of heaven. Um, that's why with this picture of heaven, um, John ends this, this revelation of his by saying, even so come Lord Jesus. Even so come Lord Jesus. All right, so we get these wonderful and incredible pictures of heaven. That's what's been revealed to us. Um, no other details have been revealed. So I can anticipate um, other questions that are coming, but I'll leave those for the Q&A uh, of it. And um, next week we're teaching on hell, so you're going to see quite a big contrast uh, between heaven and hell, obviously. And what I'm hoping is accomplished through a presentation of heaven, a presentation of hell, is we become more evangelical. Okay, we become more evangelical because um, to focus in on 80 years of living and neglect the 80 trillion they're going to follow is rather foolish, right? Okay, to, um, to be presented by the Bible of such a beautiful, wonderful place and not invite others there is kind of selfish, isn't it? Okay, so, so we'll do that. So let's close in prayer and um, we'll take your questions. From there. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Lord, for the beautiful words of heaven. Lord, we thank you for uh, the enthusiasm of Paul and John and those who have had glimpses, Lord, and uh, we celebrate the place that you've prepared for us, Lord, and, uh, and Lord, we just pray that the time that you give us here, we would be visiting the sick and the, those in prison. Lord, we would be offering a cup of water to those who are thirsty, Lord. We pray that our lives would not be about us, Lord. They'd be all about you and the care of others, Lord, so that the church would be restored, Lord, to the glory that's worthy of your name, bearing your name. So God, forgive us our sins, we pray. Wash us clean and let us today, Lord, rededicate ourselves to you because you have done so much for us. And when we see you face to face, Lord, we really want you to be pleased. So bless us, Lord, and as we do everything we can to bless you, and we pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.